welcome to our presentation for DMLC. We are happy to have you. Um, just a reminder, this is diversity and inclusion. It's more than just checking a box. Um, we're really happy to have you and we're happy to talk about these things. And just a quick reminder before we get started, if you have any questions, please jot them down um, and we will direct you on where to take those at the end of the presentation. All right, to get started, um, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Esther DeClerc and I use she, her, hers pronouns um, and I am CMN staff. Um, and as we are getting started in this and why I tell you a little bit about why I care about these topics, we would like to take the time to acknowledge that if we were in person currently, we would be in Atlanta, which was previously um, Muskogee Creek tribe land. Um, it was tribe land and the reason that we feel um, that we should you know talk about these things is because that's the history of our land that is the history of our nation and it's important to acknowledge that um, it was tribe land until 1830 when president andrew jackson um, made the indian removal act and forcibly moved several native tribes to present-day oklahoma um, the muskogee creeks being one of them so with that, to kind of talk about why this topic and these topics are important to me, um, they kind of tie directly together. So I am Native American, um, and so that is one of the, the parts of me that I'm very passionate about and that I love. Um, I am also bi, so I also am a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And, you know, those two minorities are, are big topics in the DEI world. Um, and so that's kind of why this is so important to me. It is also important to me to acknowledge the fact that while I am native and while I am bi, I also have a lot of privilege. I'm white passing. Um, and so I am afforded a lot of privileges that other folks are not. And then being bi, I have the ability and a little bit easier time um, to kind of hide that identity if, if I feel I need to. And so with that privilege, I understand that I also have a responsibility to help educate others on these topics. And I wanna use my privilege to do so rather than you know just um, taking it for granted and using it to my advantage. And so that's kind of why I feel like it's important for me to talk about these and why I'm passionate about these topics because I want to truly make um, our world a better place and a more inclusive and just place. Um, and my name is Alyssa Rollins. Um, similar to Esther, I also work at CMN Hospitals um, and use she, her, hers pronouns. And um, to, to kind of acknowledge why I'm passionate about the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and why I'm here talking with y'all today um, is that I deeply believe in the humanity of others and it is very important to me to help others see um, you know, the humanity in all of us and, and focusing on creating a more just society. Um, I recognize that I was very lucky to grow up in probably what's considered the most um, progressive and diverse um, area of our country. And I didn't realize until I left my state to go to college that that was not how everybody's experience was growing up. And it became very important to me to educate myself um, and utilize the privilege that I recognize that I have, um, again, at, in a way to lift others up um, and focus on my passion for um, teaching and educating college students is my avenue um, to help you know, make the world a little bit of a better place than it was when we were all born. Um, so that's a little bit about why I'm, I'm here. Um, and before we really get started, Esther and I wanted to make sure to acknowledge with y'all that we recognize that there may be some topics here that are a little uncomfortable for some of you. Um, there may be things that you have not heard of before or um, aren't um, as interested in or as educated on, and that is totally okay. Um, we appreciate you showing up as you are and just giving it a chance um, and hoping that you will lean into that uncomfortability because that is, is where we learn. Um, we learn through that discomfort um, and that's where we can kind of push our, our understanding and grow a little bit in terms of, of our work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just wanted to preface with that before we get started. Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, okay, so before we really dive in, we just want to give you some 
some learning outcomes and to kind of help you show or understand what we are really hoping that you get out of this presentation. So first, we want to help you um, develop a robust understanding of shared language of diversity, equity, and inclusion and re related terminology. So we want to give you a larger vocabulary um, and give you some more language around how to talk about these topics, right? Next, we want to define what it means to build and invite others to a diverse, equitable, and inclusive table. So we want to help you understand what this, this idea of a table is and then how to build that to be more inclusive. And then finally, we want to help you to identify the steps that your organization can take to become a more inclusive group on your campus. So we want to give you some tools so that you can actually put this into practice rather than just hearing it and having a better understanding of it. And to start off, we thought it was most important to make sure that everyone had a shared understanding of the words diversity, equity, and inclusion. You've probably heard the, the acronym DEI or D and I thrown around. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we started off with um, some general definitions about what these things mean. Um, and first one being diversity. And the I think the biggest takeaway here is that bolded part of the definition that talks about the the different aspects of diversity. Um, I think that it's incredibly important for us to be acknowledging that diversity is a lot more than just uh, what's typically talked about in terms of race, ethnicity, and um, you know sexual orientation and those things. That diversity encompasses a whole host of other identities um, and ways that people uh, identify themselves. And so we're hoping that y'all will will take it upon yourselves to expand your thought of diversity and in, in your your definition. Um, and then next is that word equity sounds similar to equality, but it is not the same. Um, equity is really focusing on just and fairness in our processes and procedures in the way that we set up the systems of our world um, to be to be just and to be equitable um, which really is looking at making sure that everybody has what they need um, rather than equality which is more giving everybody the exact same things um, even though some people are coming in at a different space than others um, and so that's where, where equity comes in. And then lastly is inclusion. I think that this is a, a very big word um, to understand the, the full scope of it. Um, but really we're looking at how folks feel um, and if they're being truly welcomed. And that's what we're looking for out of inclusivity is that they not only feel welcomed, but truly are welcomed, um, not only by the folks who are there, but also by the processes and systems in place um, that allow them to be a part of the decision making process in your organization um, and that they're participating fully in that. And again, that we're not just checking a box and saying that they're here, but giving them an opportunity to truly participate to the same level as everyone else. Awesome. Okay, so let's jump in. Let's hit that first um, that first piece of, of shared language, that vocabulary. And we thought that with everything that's going on currently, a big, a big vocabulary word or shared language piece that we wanted to share is ally. And what that means, um, and currently looking at the climate of our of our country and our world. Um, ally is a white or non-black person who actively works on ending racism within themselves and institutional systems. Um, we thought it was important to also mention that while in in this you know definition in this current climate, ally is being used mostly in terms of racism, but it's important to understand that allies can be um, involved in much more than just that. So matters of racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, ableism, just to name a few of the other places that allies can show up. Um, we also thought it was important to talk about the different types of allyship, right? So there are two different types of allyship, um, performance and non-optical. Performance allyship is that, that idea that we're doing something to get credit for it, or we're doing something so that others see us being better, or others see us showing up for people who aren't ourselves, right? And that's performance allyship. And while yes, somewhat helpful, also it, it feels as though it is more pressed and a little less authentic. Um, and then there's non-optical allyship. And that is 
looking at ourselves and taking a deeper look at not only ourselves, but our systems and fighting those um, systems of, of oppression um, with, with not as much return, right? So doing it because you genuinely care about these, these issues and because you want to see a difference in the world. Um, and then next we'll move into bias. So having a preference, especially one that interferes with impartial judgment and can be rooted in stereotypes. So this is what happens when you kind of, before you meet someone, you make an opinion about them before knowing anything else about them, except for maybe some of the stereotypes you've heard before, right? So coming in, not giving everyone a clean slate and, and having predetermined opinions about people beforehand. Next, which is also a large um, topic right now or a large piece of language being thrown around is BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. And this is a term that highlights um, kind of the, the relationship that Indigenous and Black people have with whiteness and how it kind of acknowledges the historical context of how these relationships have been oppressed or these um, groups have been oppressed, especially within America and the colonization of America, right? So kind of looking at it with a historical lens. And then finally, cultural appropriation. Um, this is something that we think is probably common term um, and, and hopefully that a lot of people know what it is, but this is the act of taking um, elements of a different people or a different group's culture um, and using it for our own um, benefit, right? So for lack of a better term, kind of taking things and whitewashing them for our own benefit. So then looking at gender identity, that really is that deep internal sense of self um, that can vary um, and, and encompass a wide spectrum, um, whether that be masculine, feminine, a blend of both, neither. Um, it is something that each person defines for themselves. Um, and uh, we wanted to note uh, the idea that gender identity can correspond to or differ from the sex that you are assigned at birth. Um, so sex is more biological and in that gender identity, again, is that sense of self um, and um, is focused on going beyond the kind of traditional um, and very outdated uh, concept of a gender binary and looking at, again, that wider spectrum um, of identities that folks have with regards to their gender. Intersectionality is a very important word in DEI work because it's looking at the intersection or the interconnectedness between people's multiple identities. So none of us show up in the world as just one monolithic thing. Um, we are here um, as a combination of all of our different identities and pieces of ourselves. And intersectionality is what recognizes, you know, the, the different parts of a person and how that impacts how they show up in the world. Um, an example of that um, would be um, when folks talk about the experiences of women in the workplace. Um, oftentimes what they're meaning to talk about is the experiences of white women in the workplace. And if you also look at the experiences of black women in the workplace or trans women in the workplace, um, their additional identities of being a person of color or being a person in the LGBTQ community will compound and further impact their experiences beyond just being a woman. Um, and so intersectionality is really, really focusing on that idea that we are more than just one identity. We are all of these different pieces put together. And that means that we're going to have different experiences um, than our peers. Uh, microaggressions are um, often unintentional, which is why sometimes it's, it's hard for folks to either grasp the concept or understand when they are, are perpetuating um, or participating in a culture of microaggressions. But that's looking at those, uh, those everyday kind of subtle ways um, that we are interacting with or, or behaving around folks um, that conveys some level of bias. Uh, a really good example of that that I, I heard many, many times um, is when someone will, will walk up to someone um, who is non-white and say, oh, where are you from? Well, I'm, I'm from here. What do you mean, where am I from? Um, and that is a microaggression because you're assuming that they are 
from somewhere else or that there is a piece of their identity that you're trying to get at. Um, and that is something that can be very, very hurtful to someone to feel like they are not welcomed here. Um, because I've never had someone walk up to me and ask me where I'm from. Um, and so microaggressions are again, kind of hard to identify sometimes in the ways that we speak, um, and the ways we interact with the world, but it's important to make sure we're doing that self-reflection. And lastly, person first language um, is primarily used in the accessibility community and talking about ability disability, um, but really can be used more widely than that. And really what it is, is focusing on, again, the person first. It's making sure that we're using language that puts a person at the forefront and their diagnosis or disability after that, because they are not defined by that diagnosis or disability. Example being, rather than saying um, a disabled person, you would say a person with a disability. Rather than saying a blind person, a person with blindness or a person with a visual impairment. Um, always trying to focus on the humanity of the person first because again, they're not defined by um, those other aspects of their identity. Um, so again, just wanted to make sure that we all were kind of on the same page with some shared language. Obviously there are a lot more more concepts and more words out there. Um, and we encourage you to continue educating yourselves on these topics, but wanted to make sure that we had that kind of base level understanding before we go into what it means to be building a diverse, equitable and inclusive table um, and how we can do that together. Um, so what is this metaphorical table that Esther and I keep referring to? It's something that she and I, um, and we're not the only ones, but she and I use a lot um, in general on how we talk about the world. Um, but it is particularly important um, here when we're talking about Dance Marathon. So Dance Marathon at its core is intended to be a campus-wide movement that unites all of us for one cause, which is our kids. And in order to be a truly campus-wide entity that is welcoming and inclusive to all, um, we need to continue adapting and changing and striving towards that um, and making sure that folks feel like they can be a part of our organization and assessing who is not here and how we can get them here. So when we talk about this metaphorical table, um, we are not necessarily talking about the table in front of you, um, but really looking at um, the table as a representation of a place of power and influence in an organization, um, in a, a group of people at the table that are, be, are the ones making the decisions. Um, again, they have that power, they have that influence, they're the ones making the decisions on the direction that the organization goes, what you all do, um, what your goals are. And when we talk about this table, um, in terms of Dance Marathon, that's really your leadership team. That's looking at your, your entire leadership structure. Who are the folks that have any touch point and any um, position of influence to uh, uh, influence your organization and to impact the decisions that you all are making? And we are going to talk a little bit about the steps that you can take to better um, equip that table um, and better equip yourselves to create intentional seats at that table and make sure that folks are represented there um, and given an opportunity to shape and influence and impact your organization, um, you know, beyond that idea of we're diverse because we check the box of having <clears throat> a person with this identity and a person with this identity. Um, we want to push beyond that and we want to make sure that we are genuinely inclusive and diverse and equitable in how we interact with our campus communities. Um, so now we will kind of jump into what that actually looks like in practice. Awesome. Okay, so to continue, we are going to start talking about building this table and I'm just going to warn you now. Alyssa and I are going to continue and unapologetically use this idea of actually constructing a physical table because it just works, right? It, it helps to give a visual to what we're talking about. So first, create a framework. I think we can all um, agree that creating a framework and a strong foundation are important to a sturdy table, right? So create a framework but, and start by examining you know what what you're doing as a program currently what practices and traditions do you have currently that might 
um, exclude certain groups or may not be inclusive in certain ways. So think about these practices and traditions in terms of like, what are you having meetings on, you know, religious days? Are you using things like Mr. and Mrs. DM to um, highlight and acknowledge your top fundraisers or your your best participants, right? And how does that exclude folks who don't um, identify in the binary, right? And then even more, standing for the standing for the entire event rule. How does that exclude some folks who, you know, can't stand for the duration of your marathon? Or how does that make the the kids that you're fighting for who don't have physical disabilities? How does that make them feel when when they know that they can stand, right? So look at these practices and traditions, and even the language that we're using and kind of examine how we can be better to not exclude certain groups. Next, work to build a strong foundation, right? So we need a strong foundation to sit at a table. Um, identify some, some partners on campus that might be missing within your organization as it sits, right? Look at these different groups that we're missing and think about how you can start to build um, a relationship. And when we talk about our relationship, we're not just talking about like, hey, we know each, each organization exists, come do this for us, come be a part of our organization. But instead, look at these groups, look at these organizations and start making a meaningful relationship with them. Start finding ways that you can better understand the values of that organization, how you can support them before just asking them to come be an active participant or um, before asking them to do something for you and your organization, right? And then finally, set the table, right? So now that we've built this table, let's make it a place that is welcoming to others. Use your campus resources and seek out further education and training to be become not only um, you know, better looking, but also a more informed organization that welcomes those from all campus corners of campus, right? So maybe this looks like your leadership team um, getting safe zone trained or becoming an ally, right? Find ways to not only talk the talk and say, hey, we're doing this, but also walk the walk and show up that way to actually be more inclusive, more accessible, and, and more diverse in your makeup of your team, right? So those are the first three steps. And, and now let's... Um, so once we built our table, um, it is important to talk about how we bring people to that table. Um, and something that I wanted really to, to hit on with y'all is that nobody likes to feel like a token. They don't want to feel like they're more valued because they check a diversity box um, than being valued for what they actually you know, bring to your organization. And so really want to encourage y'all as, as you start thinking about these things to make sure that you are including people authentically and you are being intentional about um, the seats at the table, if you will, that you are creating um, through this self-reflection, um, but, but really making sure that you are authentic and you are doing this truly because you want to better your organization. Um, and again, not because you just feel like you need to check a box. Um, and with that, we've got some questions that uh, we are hoping that y'all will take back to your teams um, and use as a self-reflection piece uh, on your leadership to figure out, you know, how can we actually make this happen? Um, so that first question is, who is not represented in our organization? Who is not currently here? When we look at our leadership team in particular, what groups are not currently represented um, and really think about why that is. Um, it is quite common that some of our, our leadership teams, not just in Dance Marathon, but across campus life, um, often end up being a very homogenous group of people from the same major, from the same background, um, that look the same, um, that is not uncommon. Um, but we want to make sure that we are being intentional about, you know, who is not represented here, um, and trying to, trying to fight against that, uh, that homogenous, uh, entity. Um, and so then we have to ask ourselves, how do we get these areas of campus involved? 
So now that we've identified certain areas of campus, whether it's, you know, we've never had a business student that's part of Dance Marathon, how do we get the business school involved? Or we've never had um, or don't have enough representation from our multicultural Greeks on campus, how do we get them involved? Um, really looking at what each group individually needs to want to be a part of Dance Marathon. Um, it is not all going to be the same. You're not going to have the same answer across the board. Um, so it's going to take a lot of discussion and thinking around these issues, but um, important to recognize, you know, what each individual um, or group will need to, to feel like they want to be a part of Dance Marathon. And then similar to what um, Esther was talking about earlier, are there certain aspects of how we currently do things that are making these people not want to be here? Are there ways that we talk about Dance Marathon? Are there ways um, that we incorporate traditions and things into our organization that makes people feel less welcome? Um, Esther gave some great examples of that with, you know, if we are only paying attention to um, the like Christian calendar when we are planning like, oh, of course, we're not going to do anything over Christmas. But if we're doing things over Jewish holidays or Muslim holidays, how are those students feeling welcomed um, into your organization? Or if we're always using language about, you know, having to stand, um, even if it's an unofficial rule, but like feeling pressure and having to stand during your entire marathon, how does that make folks um, in the disabled community feel about your organization? Are they really going to feel welcomed if they already know like, hey, because of this condition that I have, I know that I can't stand for 12 hours. So like, should I even show up? And that's not what we want. So we really have to do that deep dive and think about the current aspects of our organization. Um, and yes, that means looking very long and hard at some of our most cherished traditions um, and looking at if they are truly inclusive and, and provide a space for folks to really want to be a part of our organization. And if the answer to that question is no, we have to be willing to make those changes to truly move towards a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization. Um, similarly, looking at the current messaging that we're putting out um, and how that impacts who wants to be um, part of Dance Marathon and involved with us, how we talk about things and how things look on social media are important. Um, one thing that, that we've seen on quite a few campuses is that um, Dance Marathon has become synonymous with the fraternity and sorority community and non-Greek students don't necessarily feel like they can be a part of that particular Dance Marathon program because it's all Greek students because that are, those are the only people that they see on social media. Those are the only like specific challenges that they see are between fraternities and sororities. Um, and that is excluding a whole portion of our community. It's not to say that you want them to feel excluded, but that is what that messaging is saying to them. Um, and then lastly, how can we use our, any of our current participants who are connected to those areas that we've identified to bring in their peers and to help provide us with some um, insight as to how we can connect those areas back to Dance Marathon. Um, really utilizing the folks that have already bought into our cause to help us reach further into those communities and further into those organizations um, to really bring in everyone. Um, and so again, hope that y'all will take these questions, take a screenshot, do what you need to do. Um, take these questions back to your leadership team and really sit down and have a, a long and hard conversation about what this looks like on your campus. Um, and hopefully that will help y'all determine kind of some steps that you can take to help move in a positive direction. Awesome. So now that you've got people at the table, What's next, right? Where do you go from there? We've we've made this diverse table, but but what now? Um, and so I'm I'm gonna read these two questions because uh, we think that they're kind of important to think about, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what it means to give voice to those at the table. So it's one thing to have the people at the table, but what happens if they don't feel comfortable talking? If they're there but they don't have a voice, does this really help at all? So thinking about that, um, and an analogy that I kind of like to use in terms of thinking about whether the folks at the table actually have a voice or not, is thinking about if we have brought them to the, the table and gave them a proper place setting, or if we've brought them to show that they're here and just put them at the kids table, right? So the kids table, you can see the larger table, you, you kind of know what's happening up there, but you don't have the ability to speak. And so, 
let's think about when we're bringing these people to the table, not only do we want them there because we want to look and, and seem more diverse, but instead because we truly want to be. And because we want to hear these things, these, these people talk and hear what they have to say and consider, you know, areas where they might feel we're missing or, or not hitting it on the mark in terms of accessibility, inclusion, diversity, equity, um, and making sure that they feel comfortable speaking, right? And so one of the first places to look is what does your leadership team look like? What does your internal team look like? Is it made up of people who all kind of look the same, have the same experiences, and come from the same places on campus? Or is it one that is made up of a lot of different diverse um, experiences and, and um, journeys, right? And, and people who look different from each other or identify as different, right? So looking at your, your leadership team and seeing if people who, you know, may be in, under represented on campus actually have a spot at your table and have the ability to say, hey, this is where I think Dance Marathon could be better. Um, I think it also kind of looks back into thinking about the fact that not only once they're on the, the leadership team, are we, you know, giving them a voice, but making sure that they know that we want to hear and that we value and cherish what they have to say, um, rather than just making them feel like they are here because we felt we needed to check this box, right? So not only is it about bringing people to the table, as Alyssa um, so well put, but also about giving folks that voice to be able to say and feel comfortable saying, hey, I think we're wrong in this. I think we need to do better here, right? So what's next? Where do we go from here? We've, we've learned all about how to make a table and to construct a table and, you know, all these table references, but what do we do from here, right? First, we think, let's, let's draw back to those learning outcomes and what we hoped that you would get from this presentation, right? I think it's safe to say that we have hopefully broadened your vocabulary in terms of uh, equity, inclusion, diversity, and even accessibility. Um, and next, I think it also, we would hope that you have the, the ability to kind of look at your practices, look at this table that you already have and see how it can be better, right? And then finally, um, we encourage you just on your own to go back and look at, like we said, look at your organization and build your own table. Start fresh, create a new framework, build your table, um, and really not only talk the talk, but walk the walk and show up for different um, populations on campus and be what Dance Marathon at its heart was meant to be. Something, an organization that brings all of campus together, right? This is a cause everyone can get behind. And so let's set the table, let's build the table and make it just that. Um, with that, I, I just wanna put a quick reminder. Um, if you have any questions, please um, direct them to Discord. Alyssa and I are more than happy to talk about anything at all. Um, we would love to have more discussions with this. And if you are thinking about things in your own programs that could be problematic or you have an idea of how to make it better, please talk with us about it. We would be more than happy to chat. And then um, another resource that we have created is a one-sheeter that has a little bit more in-depth research um, for you about these topics. Um, and obviously, like we've mentioned before, this is not the only stuff, right? These are just kind of a broad overview of things that we find important um, in relation to DEI and how we think these are just some stepping stones of how you can get started in this. So check out that one sheeter and, you know, do some further research, do some further self-education. And like I said, if you have any questions, please hit us up. And lastly, just wanted to do a quick plug for the other diversity, equity, and inclusion presentations that are being offered this year at DMLC. Um, for any of you that have been at, to DMLC in the past, we are offering much more on this topic than um, we have previously, which is really awesome and exciting. Um, and we do encourage y'all to uh, make sure that you are looking into those as well. Um, the ones with asterisks are workshops um, versus the shorter sessions. Um, some of these are done by your peers um, at at dance marathon programs that are already doing some awesome things in the areas of DEI. Um, 
And then of course, shameless plug um, for the one at the bottom, things that make you say, oh, um, it is another presentation by Esther and I um, doing some deep dives into common practices in dance marathon um, and looking at them as case studies of how we can do better in terms of diversity and inclusion. But with that, we just wanted to say thank you all again um, for joining us for this presentation and, and for taking the time to further educate yourself on DEI topics and, and hopefully y'all can take something from this back to your organization and continue moving all of Dance Marathon forward um, as we head into another year. Um, but thank y'all again and enjoy the rest of your experience at DMLC.